Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And uh, you're one of the reasons I do this. And I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, I've got a very interesting video for you. We're going to be looking at the real life Hunger Games or Battle Royale, whichever one you prefer. And I know there's a lot of controversy out there, you know. Hey, see, Susan Collins stole the idea of Hunger Games from Battle Royale. Maybe she did. Maybe she did, but the thing of it is, they both exist. Battle Royale is a graphic novel into a movie. Hunger Games was a collection of now four novels into four movies. So, they exist. Yes, they have the same premise, but... They're a little bit different from each other, so just enjoy both of them. It doesn't matter. Inspiration comes from a lot of places. Anyway, I'll get off my Movie Geek soapbox now, and we'll talk about the real-life Battle Royale or Hunger Games, however you want to coin it. This is more of a Battle Royale, though, actually. We're talking about Stalin, his forced communism and collectivism in the Soviet Union and how one experiment led to the deaths of thousands. And with that, we're going to jump in. So let's talk about Stalin. Uh, during the years uh, 1928 to 1940, Stalin introduced his agricultural plan known as collectivism, which basically took private land ownership away from the common people and gave it over to the government who would then put people to work on these collectivized communes or farms and then be able to feed the government. There was one problem with that though and that is the peasant class or the middle class known as the kulaks who were experienced farmers had obtained ownership of their land and wanted to keep what they needed plus sell the rest into private industry uh, like you should be able to do and they did not want to give their farms over to collective farm over to collective farms over to the government and so they were many of them were forcibly removed deported killed put into labor camps and so that left a huge shortage of experienced farmers now remember the people that they're killing as dissidents are the experienced farmers so that leaves them with a whole bunch of people that agree with stalin agree with collectivism agree with communism but don't know how to plant a seed and water it and watch it grow so because of these factors and the fact that at that time Russia or the Soviet Union, however you want to term it, it was Russia at this time, was way behind the rest of the world when it comes to industry and technology. So they did not have the technology to make up for a lack of organic farming knowledge. And as a result, famines, food shortages that claim the lives of millions. In addition to these problems, you also had the gulags, which was the Russian system of labor camps for these dissidents. And like I said, started out with the kulaks, but then basically migrated to anybody that didn't agree with Stalin or, or that had pissed off the wrong person in power. 
being put into these labor camps. And so you had a very overcrowded prison system, too. And so you had two big problems that were about to collide, and the solution would then become this real-life battle royale. It was an experiment gone wrong. And so let's talk about it. Enter Jenrik Yagoda. And he looks just like his name sounds. He was the head of the secret police at that time. And he and his good buddy, Mativia Berman, also looks exactly like he sounds, uh, was the head of the Gulag labor system camp. And so they came up with this experiment that would see up to 2 million people being deported into the worst parts of Russia, that is outer Siberia and Kazakhstan. And these prisoners would then turn these areas into fully self-sufficient farms and therefore solve two problems at one time. You're getting people out of these labor camps and you're also producing more food, which could help solve the problem of the famine. And so, they decided that for the first of these experiments were to begin with the immediate deportation of 6,700 prisoners to the Nazino Island, which is a roughly 340 mile around island located in western Siberia. It was completely cut off from the rest of the lands, floating out in the river, the Obo River, alone. And so this was to be the first of those settlements. However, as often happens with communism, they were ill-prepared. You're depending on a government that can't even control itself to control widespread agriculture. What would you, if you were doing this experiment, what would be the first thing you would do? Make sure you had enough seeds, supplies, shelter, or stuff to create shelter to house, then you need to clothe, and then you need to feed these people who are going to be working this land and turning it into a farm to again feed themselves and then feed, help feed the rest of the Soviet Empire. But however, communists don't think that far ahead and they sent nothing with these people. And because the Kulaks were, of course, the more experienced farmers. They couldn't fill the quota for this island with enough Kulaks because a lot of the Kulaks had been executed as being dissidents. They couldn't fill the ranks of these 6,700 with enough actual farmers. So they had to fill this quota. And so instead of emptying out one of the labor camps like it was intended to do, they just gave quotas to the secret police and the regular police force in a myriad of Russian cities and told them they needed people. And because there weren't enough kulaks or dissidents, they created dissidents out of thin air. How convenient is that? So they decided to turn to the whole issue of internal passports. Internal passports was a system that Stalin actually brought back to basically label someone as a valued worker with a skill so that he could travel freely amongst the whole Soviet Union. So you needed a passport to go from essentially province to province, town to town. Well, they decided to create, use the bureaucracy to create dissidents out of people that had forgotten their passport, didn't have a passport, didn't need a passport. And so a lot of these people instantly became dissidents. And most of these people were taken from cities because people living in apartments know how to farm on a massive scale. I'm not saying anything about people living in apartments. I live out in the country and outside of our little garden, I don't know if I could farm on a massive scale. I'm just saying because those people are the most experienced. Instead of maybe giving actual farmers incentives, this is what you're going to do. But anyway, so there were stories of 
a 12-year-old child who was waiting for her mother on a train platform while her mother stepped into a shop to buy some bread. She was taken by the secret police. You have the story of a 103-year-old man who actually stepped outside his door to speak to a neighbor without his passport and was taken. You have a family man who was an ardent communist that went to the store to buy food and forgot his passport and was taken by the police. So basically you had all these cities cleansed of people that had made little mistakes about passports, didn't show their papers, didn't have their papers, taken and relocated to staging areas for this huge 6700 island farm experiment. All of these dissidents were sent to staging areas, like I said, in western um, Russia, and a rail convoy using mostly trailers designed to carry animals and um, building supplies were packed with thousands of these prisoners to be sent out to Siberia. They left on April 30th, 1933. And basically two or three convoys carrying thousands of prisoners. They were given roughly, details are sparse, but we have ranges from 200 grams of bread to 300 grams per bread per person. So that's about 7 to 11 ounces of just bread were given to the people on the trains for food every day. So you had a few slices of bread that was your sustenance for an entire day and of course the guards being who they were decided to make sport of these people and they would uh, commit heinous acts against the women they would also take food from others they would not break up fights they would shoot people for sport and pretty much uh, had fun with these poor people that were being sent into exile to farm for the party when they finally arrived in Siberia and were transported to the island and uh, the guards took them across on barges and these barges instantly departed and kind of took up anchor out in the middle of the river so the guards weren't actually on the island but they still had a viewpoint so that they could see what was going on. Uh, the only supplies that the party left these people, 20 tons of flour, so about nine pounds of flour per person for all 5,000 of the people that survived the trip. Like I said, they started with around 7,000, 6,700 to 7,000, and by the time the train trips were over, they were down to five. So a lot of them didn't survive the trip. And so now you've got about nine pounds of flour per person as their only supplies. And these guards would come over once a day and distribute the flour to each person. Now, you need an oven, you need water, you need eggs, you need yeast to make a, you know anything out of flour. None of that was provided. There was absolutely nothing. People began to die from exposure because we're in a winter, you know, we're getting into, this is a, a Siberian weather, so this isn't tropical paradise. Began to die from that. In addition, all they were given was raw flour. So of course you have people taking the food from other people and you have people not knowing how they're supposed to eat this they had two choices they had eating it raw or they had mixing it with some river water to make it into a paste to make it a little more easily digestible the only problem is this is dirty river water and of course immediately dysentery broke out among the prisoners and they were sleeping out on the bare ground so people started dying almost immediately this was a hellscape within the first week they would begin attacking the guards when the guards would begin to distribute the flour and the guards shot many of them and so the guards came up with a system where they didn't have to worry about this anymore they told that they were going to be divided into different tribes literally, or groups, and each group would have a leader, and the guards would give the leader that entire group's ration of flour, and it would be up to them to distribute it to their people. So, of course, you had some career criminals that had been, you know, emptied out of a jail and sent there. They immediately volunteered to be these group's leaders, and the guards not caring would give them the flour, and then, of course, they would decide who got fed and who didn't, most often keeping the flour for themselves, and so you had now the battle royale begins. You have tribe against tribe, group against group, 
this is like a Lord of the Flies thing happening. So you began having all-out all wars, and the guards would just stand on the barges, and they would watch this, and they would occasionally come out and shoot at a few prisoners for sport. But otherwise, they didn't care. There was no farming happening on this island. And so over the uh, few weeks they were there, you began seeing murder, rape, every every possible bad thing that you can see and eventually a doctor who was sent over to check on the people that had got dysentery and because there was no waste disposal system now typhus had broken out this doctor discovered signs of cannibalism and after talking to some of the people he realized that maybe many of them were eating the people that had already died or they were killing the very weak or the very sick and they were literally stripping the bodies of meat but then after a you know, few more days people were killing each other for meat there's a story of one of the guards had his girlfriend with him and he left her alone i'm not sure why they were on the island he left her alone they kept a group of men captured her tied her to a tree cut everything off that could possibly be eaten and he found her dead tied to a tree when he returned so the guards would go in and attempt to stop these uh, goings on they would attempt to arrest people but then the people would fight the guards and the people that attempted to buy to create makeshift rafts and make their way across the river or swim the river many of them would immediately sink or drown and the ones that did make it were hunted by sport for the guards so there was literally no no escape in a period of 13 weeks of the 6,000 people exiled to this island 2,000 died from starvation exposure disease another 2,000 disappeared most often either drowned trying to escape shot by guards or cannibal murdered for food cannibalism and so basically you had three quarters of the people sent there dead and immediately because of all the bad reports going back to Stalin of course the experiment was immediately ended and the people were sent back to normal labor camps although many of them dying again from the trip from the island to there and uh, you had basically this entire experiment shelved because it was no good now what can we learn from this experiment one society can break down really fast now think about it yes they had been on a train for you know a week or so without good food so we're talking a matter of weeks here that society completely crumbled now think about our own modern times how long would it take for society to crumble if we went without food for a little while I mean, look at what happened during covid with all the rating of the shelves and things like that people especially people in modern society don't know how to cope with hardships and i think our society would crumble pretty quickly if there was no food no you know no energy no power no internet i think we would see an immediate breakdown of society which is really scary so prepare yourselves definitely prepare your family have a generator have some solar panels have some food have guns take care of yourself um, also communism doesn't work and you can't trust the government uh, to take care of you take care of yourself um, so those are the t and also Stalin was one of the most evil men that ever walked the face of the earth that's what you can learn from this mainly but uh, and the deal is that this was safely covered up for a long long time these details did not come out until 1988 when a Russian human rights group investigated it and realized what had actually happened by uncovering old records. So this was able to be able to be kept under wraps for a long, long time. And now a monument that was erected in 1993 sits on a Nazino Island uh, to the victims of this experiment. And so just food for thought, those that uh, do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. So just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be back soon <laughs> with a much happier tale. I'll be back with uh, the rest of our 
horror movie reviews. I'll be back with my interview from a uh, horror movie that's actually available here on YouTube. I'll be telling you all about that. I'll be back with uh, my deep dives on the South Carolina murders and the Catholic Church. I hope you enjoyed this, and until next time, keto and cry.